Hello, I'm Pauline Jennings. Welcome to Musician Talk. It's a great honor for me to interview one of my all-time favorite musicians, my guest today, Randy Sabine. Violin is Randy's main instrument, but he's also wonderfully fluent on guitar, mandolin, and piano. His playing is emotional and honest, funny and inspiring. I love the stories he tells with his songwriting and with the music he creates. Along with the life of critically acclaimed playing, Randy is also a music educator who has influenced directly or through curriculum he's created thousands of violinists. And we get a chance to see him play right here in Northfield along with the great Pat Donahue at the Northfield Arts Guild Theater on July 23rd. If you're already a fan or hearing his music for the first time, I'm privileged to be giving you this chance today to hear some of his stories and a couple of his fabulous tunes. It's time to talk with Randy Sabine. Randy, welcome to Musician Talk. It's a pleasure to be here, Pauline. I'm so excited to have you on. I'm excited to hear about your musical journey and to dig into some a couple of your tunes today and have people hear your tunes. I'm very excited. And so why don't we just dig in? And so what I want you to do is go think back to when you first started learning about music or learning a, an instrument and take take us on a journey up to now in about 10 minutes. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, my journey started like so many people of my generation, which was listening to rock and roll on the radio, uh, seeing rock and roll bands on the television set, um, Dick Clark's American Bandstand. You know, I grew up listening to the music, the Beatles, Chuck Berry, the Rolling Stones. And by the time I was in fourth grade, I had decided that I would be a drummer in a rock and roll band. <laughs> that was going to be my calling. So I signed up for some drum lessons and my drum teacher was the orchestra director at the high school that I would eventually attend. And he was trying to build up the string program. He had a, a couple of sons uh, who were string players. Uh, one, one of his sons was in you know my age and he played the cello and an older son played the violin. And he kind of started like sending home recordings of violin music <laughs> all with me and along with my drum lesson. And, you know, his older son would play the violin for me up in his room, you know. So there, there was this sort of underlying agenda. And eventually he just said, hey, you're going to go take violin lessons from this person, Hannah Armstrong in Rockford, Illinois. And so I did. I, you know... I was just sort of doing what the adults told me to do right. at that time. And it was like the furthest thing from rock and roll drumming you could imagine, you know, the <laughs> violin. There I was. I was. Oh, I guess I'm playing the violin now. <laughs> so I took a violin lesson, you know, once a week for 45 minutes from that same teacher all the way till I graduated from high school and went off to college. So I learned old school music one-on-one -on -one with my violin teacher this is pre-suzuki although i remember her taking me out of school one day to go to northern illinois university to see uh suzuki on his first american tour he brought over a bunch of his japanese students wow. and we sat in this big auditorium and he was touring the united states announcing and demonstrating his his approach to teaching very young children to play the violin and there were these little kids up there. I think I was in sixth grade, but there were little kids up there, like way beyond me. It was like, wow. But I never lost interest in, in, in rock and roll. So I would practice my violin and then I would go down in the basement and I had a guitar and I had a phonograph and I had a stack of 45 RPM records. So I would be in my basement you know, with my guitar and my records, and I'd be learning the chord progressions to simple songs and little riffs. And never once did I ever consider, oh, I wonder if I could play violin along with this record. Right. You know, so they were two completely different worlds, classical violin upstairs on my music stand. And uh, the music I loved, the music I listened to, rock and roll down in the basement with my guitar. Did you take any guitar lessons? Never took a guitar lesson. I I had a, a book of guitar chords and I had song books with guitar shapes in them. And I just started figuring stuff out. Wow. I suppose that 
the basics, learning what you learned on the violin and drums helped you with that, helped you learn guitar. Well, you know, there is, you know, the bow is very rhythmic. The, the, yeah. the guitar strumming is very rhythmic and drums are, so there's a, a lot of rhythm involved. In fact, my, my favorite kind of guitar playing is rhythm guitar. I could play rhythm guitar in a band and never take a lead. It would be just fine with me. But then the... The layout on the guitar is in fourths mostly, and the violins in fifths. So the the patterns were were different. When I got to high school, I played electric bass in the jazz band one year, and then I played electric guitar in in the, in the band one year. And I remember getting a chart for guitar, and it had notes on it, oh, and no. I just went, "What? That you can play notes on the guitar?" <laughs> It reminded me of that joke. How do you get a guitar player to turn down, put music in front of him? <laughs> That's right. So, and I, I could just, I could read anything on the violin. And so how do I, how do I play this note? Where's that note on the guitar? It was really mind boggling. So, wow. you know, these worlds did start to, to feed each other. What I knew in the violin, you could transfer the guitar vocabulary. I could transfer over to the violin. It was a long and painful process. Did you play in any rock and roll bands in high school? Yeah, starting in in junior high school, we'd go over to my you know, friends' houses and we we turn up our Fender amps and plug in and drive our parents crazy. And then uh, I was actually in a band in high school that got gigs, so we were playing high school dances. Wow! And you know, little outdoor gigs. Um, yeah, it was fun. Played guitar. Did you ever play drums? I saved up. 50 bucks and bought a Ludwig snare drum. And that was as far as I could get on assembling a kit. <laughs> I never got a cymbal or a bass drum. And then, you know, I just got swept away with these other things. And right. the drums went by the wayside. Well, it seems, it seems like strings became your forte. All of them. Any of them. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Strings, yeah, violin, guitar, mandolin. Anything with strings and uh, and then I then piano also and that has and that, strings. It does That's a lot right. of them. <laughs> That's you right. know what got me really going on the piano was um, a day in the life when Sergeant Pepper's came out and that song had a lot of piano on it. Oh, I can I can play this. You know, started figuring that out. How um, did you start to figure that out? I don't remember exactly. It's just that I knew I had just kind of plunked around on the piano by ear and I could read bass clef and, and treble clef. So I could, we had some piano song books around the house. And so I was beginning to, you know, piece it together of, you know, how these notes are laid out on the piano to play chords. And I could hear the same chords on the guitar and I was arpeggiating the same chords on the violin. And I knew about chord progressions. I just, I just sat down and figured it out. It wasn't the most efficient way. Maybe not the most efficient way, but maybe the most efficient way. Maybe taking lessons would have gotten in the way of that, of you really learning what you wanted to learn. That's exactly right. I mean, I learned this stuff inherently. And ironically, you know, I ended up teaching college uh, at, at Berkeley College of Music and also at McNally Smith College of Music. And especially later on when I was at McNally Smith, you know, I'm I'm teaching these techniques and things that I learned on my own to students who hadn't. And that was very interesting to me is that, you know, I absorbed this organically and just through my own interest. And here were college level students that wanted to do that. And I was sharing, you know, my approaches to how to do that. And they had not had that in their in their background. So it was very interesting to have that kind of viewpoint that I spent all those years just as a kid, fourth grade, junior high school, high school, and I already had all this stuff. It just seems to me that people like you who can learn this stuff on their own and comes organically, it, it seems like it's in your DNA. Not a whole lot of people can do that. You know, just sit down and have it come organically. Not that it's not hard work and it wasn't hard work for you, but it's it still made so much sense to you. you know? Well, I was interested. I was driven and I wanted to do it and it was around me. And so I didn't have to do it, but... It was just, I was drawn to it. I mean, I, I really felt like that's what I wanted to do. And I was willing to just, you know, spend hours of my life 
doing it in pursuit of that because it was just it was just so cool you know playing music and yeah. playing rock and roll the whole idea of it was just so intriguing you know as a young person and rock and roll was you know still emerging and developing you know i was listening to these records come out one by one going wow what's this and wow what's that and then the Allman brothers and grateful dead this music was was being formulated wow and so it was exciting very exciting um, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do for your life? Really, from from fourth grade on. When I when I said I wanted to be a drummer in a rock and roll band, you meant I was it. serious. I meant it. You know, <laughs> I, I did end up <laughs> being in a band, but my as we know now, the career was was centered around the violin more than than these other instruments. And so you talked about teaching at Berkeley. You went to school there, college there. Yeah, I went there as a student uh, in 1977. I had been at the University of Illinois uh, when I graduated from high school in 1974. And that's when I discovered the music of uh, jazz violinist Stefan Grappelli. Mm. It was in my freshman year at University of Illinois, I heard the Western swing band Asleep at the Wheel. Their first album had just come out. And I went to see them play at a little club not far from where I was living a tiny little place and musicians walked off the stage right into the audience and I, wow. I went right up to one of the fiddle players they had two fiddle players which was really something I had never seen before and I introduced myself and I said you know I really like these this double fiddle thing and it's just so swinging and jazzy out that is so cool and he said well if you like this you should go check out these two musicians and I got a bar napkin and a pencil <laughs> I wrote down two names, Joe Venuti and Stefan Grappelli. And the very next day, I walked onto the record store. You remember record stores? We had <laughs> stacks of vinyl. So I went down and, and you know, I found a, a Stefan Grappelli record. And it was like right next to the Grateful Dead alphabetically. But, yeah, right. you know, I never bothered to, to look beyond that. So there was one Stefan Grappelli record there. I bought it. And I took it home and put it on the stereo and just, it blew my mind. Cause here was a jazz violinist playing with drums, bass, piano, playing a Duke Ellington tune. It don't mean the thing that then got that swing. And he just, just blew my mind. He just played like crazy. And it was right there that I decided I would be a jazz violinist. Wow. An epiphany. <laughs> exactly. And right. so then, and I learned about, you know, oh, there's a jazz school called the Berkeley College of Music. So, so I'm going to go study jazz uh, there. And that was my that was my path. So spring semester of 1977, I, uh, I was in Boston going to Berkeley. Wow. All right. Let's stop there. Put that on a pause so we can hear about one of your songs. And we're going to do minor thing, which fits with, with what you were talking about. And so why don't you tell me about the song called Minor Thing? I was getting to re ready to record a live album with the guitar player, Mike Dowling, who's one of my musical uh, pals and uh, dear friends. He's on my first two records. And we were, you know, going through the material that we were going to include on this record. And, and we thought we would do this. Uh, tune written by Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli called Minor Swing. And I suggested that that tune was such a, a standard tune for the Hot Club of France and had been played and recorded so many times. Why don't we come up with our own kind of version of it and, and write our own tune? So we mess around with the uh, with some chords and I came up with the melody. We work on it together and we called it Minor Thing. And so the recording is is myself on violin, Mike Dowling on guitar, and uh, a bass player in, live at the Cafe Carp down in Fort Atkinson. And this is our little a tribute to Grappelli and Reinhardt and our own little hot club, Minor Thing. Well, that's a perfect setup. So let's take a listen to Minor Thing, written by Mike Dowling and my guest today, Randy Sabine. Yeah, this is a tune Randy and I wrote yesterday or the day before I guess. We were so inspired by our beautiful surroundings here at the carp. Well I you may have been inspired by the carp but once I saw the dairy shrine <laughs> that was my inspiration. <laughs>
This is Musician Talk, and I'm your host, Pauline Jennings. I'm honored to have the violinist extraordinaire, Randy Sabine, on the show today. You just heard a song he wrote and played with the great guitarist, Mike Dowling. They wrote that song together, inspired by the, the song Minor Swing, and this was Minor Thing. You know, it, it takes you on a journey, doesn't it? I, I feel like I'm in a car driving down the road, and, and we're all kind of like just bopping along. And then somebody has something to say, and that's your violin when you're solo coming in. And, and there's just a lot of things to say, but you're still bopping along a little bit. It just is a great journey. It's like people have to have this song when they go on a road trip because it's perfect. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so let's let's pick up the story again. Stefan Grappelli, was this something new? This jazz violin, was this something new in the world? It was new to me. and. It was not new to, you know, Europeans because they were very well aware of Jean de Reinhardt and Stefan Capelli uh, in the swing era, and they were very popular. But that didn't necessarily translate to being popular or well-known in the United States beyond, you know, kind of a few, you know, serious cult jazz uh, aficionados. The general public didn't know these names. I had studied the violin, you know, for several years, and then I had also studied the violin at college, and no one had ever mentioned, you know, a jazz violinist or Stefan Grappelli. Wow. Um, I had I had heard some blues violinists up to that point. Sugarcane Harris played with Frank Zappa and John Mayle, and I heard him play blues violin, which was very attractive. And I heard Symphony Sid Page playing with Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks. I heard mm -hmm. Papa John Creech playing with Hot Tuna and Jefferson Airplane. But this was a whole other level of, of violin playing. It was pure jazz and swinging with a jazz quartet. And it was just so wonderful and enticing. And I wondered why I had not been, you know, encountered this in my string education. And that's another thing that happened when I decided that I was going to be a jazz violinist. I also wanted to inject this information into string education so that students studying violin at an early age would, would know the name Stefan Grappelli and the other jazz violinists. And they might even pick up the violin because they would realize that, oh, I can play jazz on the violin right. or fiddle music on the violin. Um, so I started my... Um, you know, a real movement to incorporate alternative styles of string playing into into string education. Grappelli came to the United States on his first U.S. tour, picked up a local uh, newspaper with uh, entertainment information, and I'm thumbing through it, and here's, I see the name Stefan Grappelli playing at some little club, you know, in a month or two. So, of course, I had to get up there, and I remember cutting class, go up to Chicago and see Stefan Grappelli the first night of his, his four night run, this little club called Ratzos <laughs> in uh, Chicago. <laughs> and I took my violin because I was going to meet him and I was going to play for him. And, you know, it was just like, this guy is my hero. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, a friend of mine had a Volkswagen van and we, we drove me up there and we, went to see this show and at at the break I trotted up the stairs and went right into the dressing room and introduced myself and <laughs> and he just like embraced me with open arms and he was oh. great he was happy to meet me and he was happy to hear that I because I had just you know started playing some of his music and I said here's you know what I'm playing you know here's what I'm doing I'm trying to be like you and we we ended up having a nice long friendship that lasted many many years. Oh, you know, a pile of letters and and pictures. So I met my hero and my mentor within months of you know dis discovering that he even existed. And there were a lot of string players like myself, violinists who you know wanted to play rock and roll or whatever, didn't want to be in an orchestra, and they were waiting for something. And they had also discovered Stefan Capelli. You know, on, on the heels of that U.S. tour, he really sparked a, a whole interest and in resurgence in this jazz violin. So he became very well known. 
how rare it is that you meet your heroes and they live up to your expectations and, and are kind to you. That's just such a gift. Wow. Yeah, it, it was a it was a joy to know him and be around him. The bass player that was playing with him for the for a few years, Brian Torf. After Grappelli died, I ran into Brian Torf at a, a jazz convention, and we came up with the idea that that we would form a group and as a tribute to Stefan Grappelli with you know use a couple of guitars and I would play violin and he would play bass. So we we recorded a record and we did a few tours together and in honor of our you know mutual friend and he had some great stories and i had some great stories to tell uh so that was a a nice little chapter in my musical life to hook up with with grappelli's bass player that is great randy so to wrap this kind of up you didn't know that jazz violin existed it didn't it really wasn't something that was taught in the united states you went to berkeley did they have any kind of jazz violin program at, when you went there when I was a student there, they didn't have a string major. And that was one of the reasons I left. I really wanted to focus on playing the violin and, you know, performing as a as a violinist. So I left Berkeley and went to the UW Eau Claire uh, for a semester, uh, continuing my violin performance degree there. And right after I left Berkeley, uh, I, that summer I got a letter saying, we're going to start a string department. Would you apply for the job? So the summer of 1978, and I went out and I got the gig. So the fall of 78, Berkeley hired me to come back to Boston and start the string department. Yeah. Wait a second. You were like 21, 22? Yeah, I was 21 at the time. <laughs> and Berkeley asked you to come and start their string program. That's impressive. I would say. Well, <laughs> it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down, no obviously. Kidding. <laughs> well, and I mean, no. not only you're young and you get this huge opportunity, this big ask, but also you have a chance to really inject the teaching that you want to have happen. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it was it was a dream come true. Yeah. And so obviously I was in over my head, but I rose <laughs> to the occasion because you have to. Yeah. So I... I did it, you know, and I was creating a curriculum every day. You know, I'd go to class and work through the students and the classes. And then and that night I would figure out, well, where do we go from here? So I was, you know, inventing a, you know, a jazz string method day by day just to keep ahead of, of, of the class, you know, one day at a time. And then it got easier as time went on. It was a great opportunity. And I was there for two and a half years. And how many colleges that teach that have string programs include jazz string in their program? I know that um, about four years ago, right when after McNally Smith College closed, North Texas State, which is a famous jazz school, offered for the first time a position for a jazz violin instructor. That's decades after Berkeley started their string right. department in 1978. Wow. So to answer your question it's taken a long time yeah and that's that's kind of the last frontier it's been a long struggle to get this kind of education into um, you know music ed programs uh, performance programs you know i got another shot at it when mcnally smith hired me to be their string department head that was very satisfying so i kind of bookended my my teaching career with starting off at the Berkeley College of Music and ending with McNally Smith College 40 years later. Um, and I had grown a lot as a teacher and a performer. So I felt that the work I was doing at McNally Smith was a, a big contribution. And there's many alumni who graduated from that program that are out there playing and a lot of them around the Twin Cities. So I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. You guys influenced a lot and helped a lot of musicians it's such a sad thing that that school closed but what can you do to finish up kind of wrap up the whole jazz violin thing i'm going to move to our quote which is a stefan grappelli quote and i want to get your thoughts on it here it is improvisation it is a mystery you can write a book about it but by the end no one still knows what it is when i improvise and i'm in good form i'm like somebody half sleeping i even forget there are people in front of me 
Great improvisers are like priests. They are thinking only of their God. I love that. That is a beautiful quote. It is. And I I asked him one time um, after I saw him play, I think it was at Boston, in Boston at the Berkeley Performance Center. In every show, he would stop and the uh, and the band would stop and he would play a solo cadenza, just go off from whatever tune they were playing. And he would go up and he would quote Bach and he would quote melodies from other tunes. He would just make up stuff and it was different every time. And it was just this fantastic, beautiful moment in the show. And so I was curious about that. And I did ask him, I said, so when you're doing that solo cadenza, what do you thinking about how do you how do you put that together he says oh i was thinking of my water bill back in paris <laughs> so and that quote and that, that you read like from something him, you would say that exactly he that's exactly what he did wow. and there's a lot of truth to that is that you when you're in that space you're not thinking hmm. and and i tell my students this too I said the last thing you want to do when you're up on stage performing is thinking about what you're doing you want to know the music so well and and it, and so internalized that when you perform it's like breathing that just comes naturally and that you know it's effortless and that you can your mind can wander and you can think about your water bill back in Paris at the same time that you're just producing this this these lovely sounds but on the other hand you know to be able to improvise like that takes a lot of preparation and so the thinking has to be done in your practice sessions there there is thinking involved but not when you're actually in the throes of doing it you jump on and you just go and if you have to think you're probably going to falter you know right. you don't think about breathing you don't think about walking um if you had to put a thought into every step and every breath you know you'd fall over right so that that is a that is a beautiful quote that will wrap up our jazz violin section of the interview you play all every kind of music on i would say maybe every kind but maybe not metal i don't know um on your violin you play a lot of different genres I think that you're just that kind of person that loves music. And so it just doesn't matter really what it is. If you love the song, it doesn't matter what genre it is. I mean, I'm drawn to certain genres and I, I sort of have a few fortes in certain things. But if someone started playing a song or a, a certain type of music, if I sit there and listen, I can find a little channel for me to, to pop into and contribute something. So that just speaks to the fact that improvisation isn't just in the jazz realm. It's you use it everywhere. Right. We use it all day long, every day in our lives. Right. It's fitting in, you know, speaking. How do I fit into this situation? What do I need to be doing to be doing something appropriate? If you're holding a violin and there's music around and you're in a room of musicians or you're on stage, you know, listen and join in the conversation wow. it doesn't have to dominate it doesn't have to be great it just could be a little thing but just you know work your way in we're working on our improv right here right now our speaking and answering questions we certainly are <laughs> <laughs> so uh blues is one of the one of your fortes and this next song is called dead man blues which is a very clever song as as you are want to write uh, you're a very, <laughs> very, very clever songwriter and very funny. Set up Dead Man Blues for me. Well, this this was based on a joke, which is <laughs> what, did the, what did the blues musician have written on his tombstone? Didn't wake up this morning. <laughs> and it's a musical joke because, I mean, if you listen to the blues, every other song starts with woke up this morning. Right, right, right. So, so that's this guy's epitaph. And I thought, well, that is the first line of a song. And then to, to draw it even closer to home, because I'm going to be playing with Pat Donahue, I I took the first few lines of a song he wrote um, called It Could Be Worse. And his verse goes, woke up this morning, got out of bed, 
looked at my reflection, I thought I must be dead. So when I said, okay, I'm going to write Dead Man Blues, and it's going to be, didn't wake up this morning, and I just copied Pat. Didn't wake up this morning, didn't get out of bed, didn't look in the mirror. It's because I'm dead. So I, I totally Perfect. spoofed Pat. Then when I recorded this, I thought, I'm going to get Pat to sing this song. Because yes. you can write songs, but if you're going to put something on a record, it'd be nice to have somebody who can really sing. And I'm not a singer, although I, I do sing. But, you know, not being a singer doesn't stop a lot of people. It doesn't stop me. But I thought it would be much better to get a really authentic blues singer to sing it. So I got Pat to sing the song, and he plays electric guitar on the cut as well. And there are a couple other musicians that recorded this song with you. Well, there happens to be a drummer. Mm -hmm. His name is Steve Jennings. Yes. You may know him. I might. I might just know him. And <laughs> note that I love to listen to you sing, so I don't agree with your, your assessment oh. of your voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's take a listen to Dead Man Blues. This was written by my guest today, Randy Sabine, and he's playing violin on it. And Pat Donahue's the singer, and he's playing electric guitar. And my husband, Steve Jennings, is on the drums. Here it is. I didn't wake up this morning. I didn't get out of bed. I didn't look in the mirror. It's because I'm dead. I got the dead man blue You know I done played my last rip I'm laid out cold and stiff I got the dead man blue My baby never left me She was always my best friend she Stood right there beside me And loved me to the end Now I got the dead man I'm just an old cadaver I got the dead man After years of sinful living, struggling and paying dues, I thought I would be forgiven. Now I got an eternity with the blues. I got the dead man blues. Ooh, yes, I got the dead man blues. You won't see me smiling, way when they lay me in the grave. Cause I'm dead and I got the My old pal Robert, my widow gave him one of my trucks to add insult to injury. The guy still owes me 40 bucks. It's enough to give a dead man the blues. Ooh, yeah, I got the dead man blues. If you got a question, you better ask it before they close the lid on that casket, or you'll have the dead man blues.
keep on rambling Where you never can tell I might spend my summers up in heaven And my winters down in hell I got the dead man's blue Oh, I got the dead man blue You know my agent booked me a room But it's six feet under the tomb I got those dead man This is Pauline Jennings, and you're listening to Musician Talk. You just heard Dead Man Blues, written by my guest today, Randy Sabine. He's playing violin on this track with Pat Donahue on vocals and electric guitar. Randy and Pat have a show at the Northfield Arts Guild on July 23rd. It's part of the Northfield Arts Guild 411 concert series, and tickets are on sale now at northfieldartsguild.org. I just want to say about this song that Again, it's so clever, but I love the interplay between the violin and the electric guitar. And it's there's a lot going on, but everything has its place and they're perfectly placed. And then you come together and that I, I just get so much satisfaction listening to a song like that. <laughs> yeah. And this is this is part of, you know, improvisation is, you know, listening, finding a little spot for you to play, giving the room for other people to say something. And you can you can blend in with that. You can stay away from it and find a different place to play. And it's just dancing around each other and in, in a musical way. Mm. Um, and that's exactly what Pat and I will be doing, you know, at our concert. We we don't sit down and, and rehearse every note like the uh, a symphony orchestra would do. Right. Um, I think that's one of the things w w when I think about being, you know, all the years I spent playing classical music and studying it and being in orchestras is, is the rehearsals, you know, working a passage over and over, getting the bowing just right, making sure it's the right volume, and then the conductor wants you to get that measure, just that passage just right, you know, and you you sweat it. You, say, you come to that passage and you go, oh, am I going to blow it? Oh, no, it was lovely, you know, all that. So when when I play with, with people like Pat, we have a lot of freedom to just, like, emote and just merge into each other, Um on the spur of the moment. And so the rehearsal isn't uh, all that necessary. We have a few little things to work out. You know, it's not this grueling worked out right. uh, thing. Well, you guys can get away with that because you're such masters at your craft. And also I just have to say, I did see you guys play together and it is pure joy. It looks like you guys are just having so much fun. And so that translates to the audience wonderfully. Well, it's it's fun music. I mean, and our personalities come through. Pat is is a funny guy to hang out with. He's friendly, and 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 we're no different on stage. So we just we, we like music. We like people. We like playing music together. But it's all it's all poignant. Pat writes some some beautiful right uh, beautiful songs, love songs, and and you know evocative uh, images. So we go the we run the gamut. You do. I have best gig, worst gig here, and I'm sure you've had a ton of best gigs, but just give us a little glimpse into one of your most joyous or most memorable times on stage. And if you want, tell us a story about the bad time. <laughs> sure. 
Well, I, you know, I, I'm going to give you an example of just a general type of gig. Okay. And if I can be on stage with people that I love, mm. playing music that I love, that is the best gig in front of people who will love what we do. <sighs> you could be on stage with people you love playing music you love and people could not be listening, ignoring you, and you could not maybe be having the best of, of possible time. But like when we go and play with Pat at the Midway Saloon on Wednesday night, as the greatest gig ever. People right. are there, they're digging it. We're having fun on stage. We're playing music we love with the musicians you love in front of an audience that we love and they love us. It's a big love fest. <laughs> nice. um, but I'm up here right now at the uh, the Big Top Chautauqua in Bayfield, Washburn area of Wisconsin. And this is one of the coolest gigs ever. You play inside a canvas tent. Uh, it's a summer long festival. I'm part of the house band up here. And I get to play with a lot of different musicians, get to play with a lot of different, um, in a lot of different shows, a lot of different styles. There's a tribute to the Woodstock Festival. We did it for the 50th anniversary. It's called Back to the Garden. And I get to play electric guitar in it all night. Oh, what that fun. Was my peak. That was like, this was what I dreamed of doing when I was in fourth grade. I was going to say. Being a rock and roll band. I don't play violin all night. I play, I start off by singing Going Up the Country, the canned heat tune. And then... Oh, doing I do Carlos Santana lead work on Oye yeah, Como on. and you know all those guitar riffs and the introduction to Woodstock that wild Neil Young crazy intro that he does on the Crosby Stills Nash and Young version of Woodstock I get to do that uh. and I get to wear a leather fringe jacket <laughs> that is the best gig ever that sounds like the best gig ever. I love it. And now you're telling me that that has already happened. Yeah. Unfortunately, we can't it. get tickets to it. I would have right. loved that. Well, it's yeah. it's up at the Big Top Chautauqua, so it's it runs through the end of September. I, and you can come up and see me play in a Neil Young show, or um, there's another there's other Woodstock shows, you know, scheduled. Where can people find your schedule so they know when you're playing and where you're playing? randysabine.com and it's randysabine s-a-b-i-e-n.com so that's easy as long as you spell it right and that's where they can find you well i'm so excited that you're coming to northfield for the 411 summer concert series at the northfield arts guild theater on july 23rd it's at seven o'clock it's a sunday and you're playing with pat donahue two great absolutely fabulous musicians and wonderful people um, that you get to see in an intimate sp space, which is just the best place to see master musicians. I don't know. I'd rather see you there than at a big, huge place and be 50 rows back. And so get your tickets now at northfieldartsguild.org. And Randy, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out to talk to me. I've been wanting to interview you and I've been waiting for you to come down to Northfield and now you're coming. So I got a chance to interview you. So thank you. Well, you're a dream come true. Thank you, Pauline. Thanks. Can't wait to come down there. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so very much to Randy for sharing his musical journey and music with us today. Thanks always to the fabulous Wendy Nordquist and to you, dear listener, for tuning in to Musician Talk on the One, KYMN. Have a stellar day. 